calling tonight's meeting to order for Thursday, March 5th, um, the school board business meeting. May I please have the attendance? Yes. Ms. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giptos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Mr. Bennett? If you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, there is one adjustment to tonight's agenda so far. Um, 10.2, the meeting minutes um, for the business meeting of February 27th, that will be deferred until our next meeting on March 19th. Are there any others? Okay, seeing none. Um, public comment on tonight's agenda. Seeing that nobody is here, I'm gonna close that <laughs> and move straight to the superintendent's report. Great, thank you. We'd like to uh, give a report on enrollment. And on the uh, left-hand column, we have the schools. And you can see from March 1st how we've changed from February 1st. And I won't go through each of them, but if you look at the very bottom, we're at 3,013 students. And so we're up three students from February 1st. The next column, which is yellow, you look at the September 1st count down at the bottom there, we're at 2,991. And if you look at March 1st and compare that, we're up 22 students. And the best fit model, the research that we've done over the years shows that we're right in line with where we should be. Uh, total enrollment according to what the research indicated was 3,003 3, students. So we're still growing and, and uh, anticipate more growth uh, for next year as well. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Moving into the chair's report, um, I will be sending out tonight a link, a doodle link for everybody um, so that we can get our annual board retreat to be scheduled. Um, the topics for this is going to include our annual FOIA training, um, grounding on Robert's Rules of Orders, as well as going through our board norms. Um, the dates that are on there may be subject to change. We haven't gotten the list of um, budget outreach meetings, so there may be an impact with that once those schedules come out. Um, I just hadn't seen that yet. Just a reminder for everyone at home, kindergarten registration began on February 21st, 25th, so please make sure to get the littles registered as soon as possible. Um, for anyone who's looking for plans on Saturday night, the boys hockey team will be at the Colise playing the Lewiston Devils. That should be one heck of a game after the triple overtime this past week. Um, late start Wednesday, yay, um, is Wednesday, March 11th. And for our incoming third graders, Wentworth will be hosting a welcome night on March 25th at six o'clock. And I know the students um, will be covering a lot of these as well, but there are a few, few people I really want to call out. Um, the Gaziano Lineman of the Year, this is one heck of an honor. Um, two linemen are chosen throughout the entire state, one offensive, one defensive, and Nate Mars won for Scarborough this year. Um, again, amazing. Even cooler in the fact that his older brother Logan also won this when he was a senior. So go big Nate. Um, if you caught this on New Center 6, Varsity Club winner, Jarrett Flaker, yet yeah, another amazing senior. There's no stopping either one of those two, but <coughs> congratulations on your Varsity Club win. Our academic decathlon won the state championship last week. Again, outstanding. I believe this is the second year in a row. Mm, so. Or maybe even longer. Maybe they've won for a while, yeah. yeah. They're a very strong team. It's incredible. And last but not least, um, the high school concerto comp uh, competition was this weekend for the who are the best uh, musicians in the state of Maine, and junior Alex Lehman won. Um, if you've never heard Alex perform, he is an incredible flautist, piccolo player. Um, I can't say enough good things about the talent that he has, so congratulations, Alex. And moving into student reports. Oh, 
All right, so I just wanted to begin my report by touching on what <coughs> Leah just talked about. Um, so the boys' hockey team, they made it to the state championship where they're playing Saturday at 6 at the Lewiston Coliseum. After they beat Edward Little in triple overtime, the score was 3-2. to two. It was a very exciting game. And then academic decathlon, they won states last Friday, which is a huge honor. And they'll be traveling, traveling to Alaska next month to compete in the national competition, wow. which is very exciting That's for them. Very cool. Um, some other highlights in sports since our last student report. Girls hockey made it to the final round of playoffs. Boys swimming won third place at states, and the unified basketball team came just one point short of beating South Portland in one of their most recent games. Um, so the Key Club brought in representatives from Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a climate change um, and environmental, environmentally friendly organization. Um, they came in to talk to Key Clubbers about how to preserve the environment for future generations. And going on with the environment theme, the Environmental Club of Scarborough is running a fundraiser to help fight the wildfires in Australia. Students from Ms. Joyner's computer science class are working on a boat building project, so they were researching and planning different boat prototypes. As you can see, they were trying to put pennies in the boats and see how many they could put in without it sinking. I remember I tried doing this in chemistry class last year and it was very difficult, it was a lot more difficult than it seems. Um, Ms. Stanhope's anatomy and physiology class performed an electrophoresis testing lab, and apparently this is a lab where you can separate specific proteins in blood, which is very interesting and a really great hands-on experience for the students. And I wanted to congratulate Angela, who is in Mr. Bennett's eighth grade class. She was the winner of the middle school 2020 geography bee back in January, and she took a qualifying test online and has become eligible to compete in the state GOB. So you had to receive one of the top 100 scores in the state to become eligible for the state bee and that will be held on March 27th. So best of luck to Angela. And then Max had some slides that he wanted me to show. Sadly, he couldn't be here tonight. Um, so today, children learned through play um, and they were given the opportunity to learn through play, which has diminished over time with a more emphasis on the academic curriculum. This is a really great opp opportunity for students to have fun in the classroom. Um, and the primary school, schools are really trying to honor students' needs to play and the importance that it has on K-2 development. Fifth grade students at Wentworth have been working on complementary color blocking in this project inspired by artist Janet Gates. And kindergartners at Pleasant Hill have been making spots of kindness and spots of happiness to help grow their reading skills and engage in SEL. And that is all I have. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. <laughs> right. Committee reports. Communications? Communications. Um, I would first like to thank everyone who contributed to the district newsletter. Um, I put out several requests and due to snow days and sickness and kind of all kinds of various things, the newsletter is going out a week later than we had hoped, but um, I really appreciate everyone who submitted something. Um, and if you want to click the link, there's like a little, Hillary was kind enough to put a preview up and a huge shout out to Hillary. Um, back before she had a full communications committee by her side, she was kind of a one-woman show, and she did a lot of these templates that we now rely on using, um, but they are all on her computer, which is a Mac that nobody knows how to use. And so, well, well, <laughs> aside from Hillary. <laughs> and so, Hillary was kind enough to compile all of the written material that we had gotten and um, put the whole thing together into something that looks so professional and so beautiful. So thank you very much to Hillary. Um, in terms of communications um, upcoming, it's the budget. Um, we, know it's, we know that this is um, one of the biggest tasks that we have as a communications committee um, is to um, not only communicate the, the facts and the figures, but also to um, you know, encourage goodwill and garner happy feelings about all the amazing things that our budget allows us to do. 
Um, and so we have last year's um, budget timeline to work from, um, which we think was really successful. And so we're going to be working from that same model that we used last year. Uh, Spotlight Award, our next winner will be celebrated on March 19th. And I will take a second to show everyone, look what I made. So the flyer on my slide tonight, I made myself. I did not have to have <laughs> Hillary even help me do it. I'm with, super impressed. <laughs> <laughs> with Canva.com. So I had put out a request um, to maybe seek out some help within the district to help the communications committee learn how to use Google Docs or whatever software we have available to us um, to put out professional looking things for communications that, weren't, that wasn't relying on Hillary's Mac. And I got such quick response and I appreciate that so much. Um, Hillary actually pointed us towards canva.com. Um, it's how she's been making some of the things that you see on social media already. And so as a communications committee, we are uh, giving it a test drive. IT was able to set up an account for us and we can all log in separately. So, because one of the things we were concerned about is well, what happens when we move on and you know, we want to be able to change out our members. Um, right now, we're just using the free membership um, as homework for the committee. We're all going to you know, play around with the software and see if it's something that we feel like we need to invest in the, in the upgraded version. So stay tuned for that. Um, so, as usual, you're going to hear the same thing that you almost always hear about negotiations, which is that it's a closed process, um, and that is dictated by the state and statutes, but um, we were able to make a statement at our last meeting um, after we had a meeting with the SEA, and I just wanted to reiterate the statement. This is actually the same statement that Amy Glennon made when she was up at the podium, um, but uh, I'll just read it again, that we had a productive negotiation session with the SEA on um, Wednesday, February 26th, and we were able to reach a tentative agreement, which um, you might hear referred to as a TA, on the remaining issues from fact-finding. Um, and then the negotiations team was able to update the board at the very next night um, in an executive session. Um, so now, in the next few weeks, the SEA will um, make some time to connect with their members, and we hope to ratify a contract at that time. Um, so, like I said, this isn't new. I just wanted to reiterate it. Um, and then, other than that, there is nothing new to report. Okay. Thank you. Bill Oh, Good. this is me again. Okay. Um, so, so normally this is like a, a liaison role that Alicia and I have, um, well I guess, I don't know, it's, it's not a board committee, but we wanted to put it in the committee updates um, so that we could just have a chance to um, keep you informed about what the processes are and where we are, um, and then also give you an opportunity um, during this update if you have any questions um, or discussion items that you want, Alicia and I are both happy to um, answer what we can. So I just as a reminder, this is, um, I mean, we all know this because we chose the committee, but I just wanted to remind everybody that our committee, we're really super, super lucky with the amount of expertise that we have on our committee. Um, we have two structural engineers, we have a landscape architect, a sustainable co uh, sustainability coordinator, two facilities directors, including our own, Todd Jepson, um, and, and a member of the community who's a facilities director at um, a very large company in Maine. Um, two school board members, an assistant city manager, and then we have um, the three K2 principals and a K2 teacher. Um, and then I just wanted to put on here um, that also three of these members, th these aren't separate members, but three of the above members are principals at architectural and engineering firms. Um, and I would not have known what that meant like a month ago, but I will tell you now that what it means is that um, they are the people at their firms who are in charge of doing the exact kind of projects that we are doing. And in fact, um, any of the people that we interview, any of the firms that we interview, and all of the um, RFQs that we received back, all of those responses, the people in charge of doing that are the principal architects or the principal engineers or whatever they might be at those firms. Um, 
So we're just really lucky that we have them because not only do they have a really, really deep base of knowledge about the process, well, yeah, about the details and the, the data and all the all of the information that goes into this, but they also are so familiar with the process that it's been super helpful because it is kind of like learning another language. Um, we make fun of each other a lot because the, all the education people in the room kind of speak in acronyms and they, they are like, what are you talking about? And they, but they do the same thing for, for their careers. Um, so it's been great to have them because we've learned a ton from them. Um, and then I don't know why this. Just click the, oh, can you click again? Okay. Sorry. So I, I did that by accident. I was trying to like make an animation and apparently it worked, but it didn't look like it worked when I first made it. Um, so the second thing that I wanted to talk about is just, just super quick recap of what we've kind of done already up to this point. I mean, I know you guys all know this, but um, at the very beginning when the committee was first formed, we did a ton of research on the data that we had, um, including enrollment, programming, um, facilities, and then we took some time to analyze that and talk about it and have discussions about it within the group. Um, and then at that point we came to the recommendation that you guys all know about we, that we brought forward to the board. Um, and so after that point we, cre we wrote or created the RFQ which was that um, request for qualifications document um, that you probably remember hearing about. I just um, wanted to, I, I, I linked to it so that you could see it. Um, so this is what it looked like. Um, it's in the shared drive, so if you want to take a closer look at it at any time, you can. Um, but this was what we put in, I think we had to put it in, do you remember saying like three newspapers or two newspapers? We had to publicize it in a, in a very specific way because it is dictated by the state and how we have to do this process. Um, so we were able to write this up. Um, like we talked about, it had uh, avenues open for either consolidation, sorry, you probably won't like this um, or renovation. Um, and then basically what it does is um, it gives you, it gives the firms that might be interested some requirements for what we expect to see in any submission. A lot of these requirements, again, are dictated by the state. Um, they have a very specific uh, agenda for what they, what information we need to collect. Um, some of it is, and then, and then you can add on to that. Um, some of the stuff the state wants to know is um, like some financial background about the company and uh, workload, like what other projects you have that might coincide with our project. Um, and like I said, um, you, can look, you can look through this yourself. I just wanted to um, link it there really quick so that you could kind of get a better idea of what that looked like. Um, so once that went out, there was a deadline on that <laughs> and we received um, seven responses. And while that was out and we were receiving those responses, the committee worked to create um, or establish a, an evaluation or um, that, that um, would look at all the criteria that we were interested in for the RFQ and how well firms met it. Um, and then when we had all those responses after the deadline passed, we used that evaluation um, that we had talked about and discussed um, to actually evaluate the RFQ responses. And um, from that, it's, it's very similar. I can't talk about the specifics of how we did it, but it is very similar to um, the way we've done evaluations before where um, each, uh, each uh, section or criterion has a number value assigned to it. And basically you kind of end up when you put everyone's together with a a numerical list of how people did in terms of um, highest to lowest score. Um, so in that process, three were pretty clearly floated up to the top and we were able to, um, to ask those three firms to interview. Um, so before they came in to interview, I just really quickly put together um, a document here. This is also in the drive. This, I, 
pulled a, a few things together for this, so this hasn't been in the drive before, and if you guys want to look at it, it's there. Um, but what we did as a committee was we really sat down and thought about all the things that were um, really meaningful for this project to all the different committee members, and we kind of prioritized a list. And in asking firms to come and interview, we gave them our top six um, priorities and asked them to be prepared to talk about as, as talking points, those, those, um, those topics. So um, I just kind of highlighted in bold the, the main idea of each one of these. It was basically public engagement, um, health, safety, and security, long-term planning, um, the small school feel, the sustainability approach, and um, the ability to facilitate solutions for our district. Um, so like I said, I know that's a lot of words, and if you want to go back and look at it, or if you have any questions after this, we can kind of um, go back to it, but if it, you know, it doesn't like me right now, all right. Why, Kelly, why? <laughs> Kelly, help me. <laughs> Um, can you just flip to the next slide? First I know I'm going super fast, but I promise. So, um, I, I am trying. I think both, both of us and and the members of the committee are trying to be really careful to make sure that we are going about this process properly. So we did talk to the lawyers, and they were um, able to confirm that we can say that we got the seven RFQs, and we can name the three firms that we decided to um, interview. So uh, the three firms that we interviewed was actually, it, this, was, this happened yesterday, it was an all day event. Um, and we interviewed Harriman, um, which is probably familiar to some of you because they worked on the Wentworth project. Um, Lavallee, Bresender, which um, also has done a lot of work in the area, and Perkins Eastman. Um, and so we, uh, we did that yesterday, we did a very similar evaluation based on those interviews and we are meeting on Monday um, to report out to the full committee um, what our impressions were of, of the three firms that we were able to interview. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about what will happen next. Um, so we're planning on having a, a choice on, by Monday if, if all <coughs> goes the way that I, um, we've planned. Um, and then from that choice, there will be a motion. We'll, um, we'll ask the board for a motion to approve contract negotiations. Um, so once you choose a firm, you then enter into contracts. Um, contracts work a little differently, a lot of different ways. Sandy will do the negotiations, um, and it will be, if that all goes well, then we'll be able to start working, that contract will go through, we'll be able to start working with that firm. And what that means, is um, as soon as they, I can confidently say that as soon as we pick somebody, any one of these three will hit the ground running. Um, their first <clears throat> order of business is really to get to know our community and our schools, our school community and our um, parent community and, and really everyone in town. Um, they will help the committee to form subcommittees. Um, those will include things like communications, design, um, I, I don't even know. Um, so they will also do a lot of programming research, meaning that they will go to the schools, talk to the teachers, talk to the administration, um, find out how they use their current spaces, what works, what doesn't work. Um, they will pro more than likely talk to some kids. Um, they will be um, responsible for the majority, well not the majority, but the They'll, they'll be responsible for coordinating the outreach that we have, whether that be to parents, um, community members, staff, whatever that is. Um, and then they also, obviously, I mean, because they're an architecture firm, right? This is what you expected. They work in the design. Um, uh, they also work on the site selection, um, the cost analysis, and like so much more. Um, and if you've ever felt like you are like, what is happening with the, uh, building steering committee and like what's our role here I think the answer is that we've really been waiting to choose this firm because once the firm comes on these are all architectural engineering firms 
um, this is what they do. They are, are able to like see the big picture. They've done this a million times. They set a schedule. It includes outreach. It includes all of the, you know, t touring other buildings. It includes all kinds of things. And that's really what their expert expertise is on. And that's why we're using them. Okay, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I felt like I hadn't given a really in-depth analysis of what we've been doing. So I just want to make sure <laughs> Alicia doesn't have any, do you have anything to add? I totally no, did thank that. thank you very much for doing that. Um, and so it, I'm happy to have you ask questions now. If I can answer them, I'm, I'm happy to. I also just want to make sure that you know that Alicia and I are both available. If you have questions outside of a meeting that you've thought of, um, not only are you all welcome to attend a building steering committee meeting at any time, but um, feel free to email us or, or um, email Andrew, who's the chair. He's also like so open and so excited and willing to talk about this. Um, so yeah, Great. a lot of silence, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you doing this. This is Mr. a nice recap. Sorry. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to say is that um, you know I was thinking back as you were started talking. The, my first thought was wow, we formed this building steering committee to, to answer one question and look how far they've gone. And then the more I thought about it, I realized that in our conversations we had with the Wentworth people, when we talked with them at the very beginning before this committee even existed, the two things they said was that you need to find a group of people which is just largely community driven that will take this and run with it, that'll be excited about it, that'll do this work, keeping the district and the board involved, but that the board really shouldn't or should resist driving this process and what you've just described is exactly what they told us to do and we didn't even at least from my perspective it ju it's just happened and now to see it summarized in two slides is actually really exciting because you have dedicated people uh, community members with a lot of expertise you've got board involvement all the way through you've got the district leadership at the table um, it, it's just really exciting to see it moving forward this way. I think for a while, I, I speak for myself, I kind of didn't really, I'd gone to a few meetings, I wasn't exactly sure what, what had gone on, and to see it all listed out like this, it's overwhelming just how much you guys have done. So, thank you. Well, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't think to list it out like this yeah. before, but I'm glad that it's helpful. Mm -hmm. It is, again, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you before. Um, I'm glad to see this and would echo everything that Nick has said. Um, and obviously a ton of work has gone into this. My only question I think is, I don't know if you guys have this or not, but a timeline, like an updated timeline based on when you expect to sign a contract and our end point. Just Yeah, so originally I had made a pretty little mm -hmm. timeline. Um, and, I, and, and I didn't put that in there for mostly because um, as of like now, that is still actually the timeline that we're working from, but I know that it's gonna change mm -hmm. um, because I know that part of what an architectural and engineering firm will do is to um, really uh, like dig into that timeline and, and get much more granular than what we had. So, I mean, yes and no, so, so that is part of their job, and, and like I said, they, that timeline will have everything on it. I mean, it'll be a bunch of overlapping rectangles of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I guess my, my, I don't really have a good answer to that, except that that's kind of like what their job is. Um, and I think that we've been talking a lot about um, the, whether we can make, whether we want to um, pursue the November mm -hmm. date or whether we want to move out to the June date. And I think the <clears throat> consensus is, you know, these <laughs> firms are going to make this happen no matter what date we give them. Um, and what we want to make sure of once we have our firm chosen is that um, we, wanna, we want them to help us um, as part of that analysis to say um, do we have enough time to do this right in this amount of time and um, they need to be able to say yes but they also need to be able to say no to us if they don't think that's the case um, 
So, so I don't really yeah, have a that's, super answer that's beyond that. I'm sorry. For. Does that sound right to you, Alicia? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. This was super helpful for me too. Um, I'm still in awe at how much has been accomplished in a short amount of time. Finance committee. I will be doing the finance committee update since Sarah is unable to be with us. Um, I have very exciting news. The <laughs> impact fees were approved last night. So this is something that we've been talking about since the fall. Um, we knew that the, just to give a refresher, we knew that the Eight Corners modular project, um, so going way back, we accessed um, the impact fees account for the first time um, last spring in order to obtain $260,000 to pay for a set of modular classrooms at Eight Corners um, to accommodate the kids who came in this year um, and to alleviate some of the space issues that they were having at Eight Corners. Um, the impact fee account is um, overseen by an ordinance um, and the town council has control over that um, account in terms of us being able to withdraw those funds. And so um, to move us forward in time after the trailers arrived and um, our facilities modulars arrived, our facilities manager, <laughs> Todd Jepson, um, had some overages that we were not anticipating. Um, hmm. all kinds of things, and that's been presented to us several times, things like the sprinkler system that needed to be done, and um, there were a few other things. Um, and so we ended up with um, an overage on that, on that project. Um, as a finance committee, we met and discussed whether or not we would like to um, use existing CIP funds um, to pay down that overage or whether we were going to approach town council to request um, impact fees once again. We all kind of agreed with Kate's guidance that um, we would try and access the impact fee account first um, rather than see where we could pull CIP money from. Um, it was going to have an impact if we used our existing CIP money. It was going to come away from something that we were planning on doing. Um, and so, Long story short, we um, submitted our request to the town council and they put us on the agenda last night. Um, they discussed it. Um, there was some questions about the ordinance because the original ordinance, the wording of the ordinance is significantly out of date and so the town council knows that that's something that they need to address on their end. Um, there was some discussion about whether or not um, this, was, this was considered an appropriation which would be an increase to our overall budget um, which obviously we are not allowed to do because our vote, our budget is approved by the voters. And so there was discussion about whether or not this qualified as appropriations. They had their lawyer weigh in on that and the lawyer decided, uh, he said that it was not considered that, that this is a fund that the town council has that is a, that they can spend from. And so technically, and they amended the motion that, that was originally submitted, um, to say that the town manager is actually going to be able to access those fees. Um, and so he and Kate will be in touch with how exactly that transaction happens. But long story short, we are, we are going to pay for that overage out of the impact fee account. Um, also from uh, the town side, um, the annual auditor's report uh, workshop happened a couple of weeks ago. Nick and Kristen and I were in attendance. Um, Great news, there was no recommendations. Um, and in auditor speak, um, that means that there wasn't anything with the school side of the audit that needed to be addressed whatsoever. Um, and so we essentially got a clean bill of health and, and uh, a grateful audit team because our staff is so easy to work with and all of our um, dots, our T's were crossed and our I's were dotted. <coughs> For your calendar, um, we have a lot of um, budget related meetings coming up. Some of these are just committee meetings, um, but for the community's um, interest, I put them up on the slide. So Monday, March 16th, we have our next um, finance committee meeting. Then Tuesday, March 24th and Wednesday, March 25th are our budget workshops. This, this is 
the big meeting that we have every year with our leadership council. Um, the full leadership council attends, the full board attends. And it's really the first opportunity that we get um, as a school board to hear from each department um, what their budget drivers are this year and kind of gives us a preview of what their requests are going to be. Um, and it also, give, it also informs our decision making um, because they present to us in terms of why their priorities are what they are. Um, and so that's a really great learning opportunity for us. Uh, sidebar to that is we have invited town council to attend those sessions um, as well. Um, Monday, March 30th, we have another um, regular scheduled committee meeting. Um, and then Wednesday, April 1st, is the town council FY21 budget presentation by Sandy to the town council. Um, and the way we've structured it this year um, is that Sandy will do his presentation to the town council and it's a non-action item for them. And then the following night, we will get an, an an abbreviated version maybe, because we will have been so entrenched in it, but uh, Sandy will present the budget to us for first reading. That's all. Can I ask oh, a question? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we, those meetings on the 24th and 25th, we don't get any materials in advance of that, correct? So right now, um, Sarah has been working with Kate to get the budget books out to us in advance, us being the finance committee and the board. Um, in years past, they have been working on that book right up until the 11th hour. Um, and so Sarah, and we did, we, did, we had it a couple days early last year. Um, and so Kate definitely um, is aware that we would like to have it. Um, and so the hope is that we'll have it a few days early. You're welcome. Long range All right. So before I talk about this monstrous table, I just want to do a, a, a <laughs> brief kind of history overview as to how we got to this point. So going back over the last several months, I'm not going to recap every single one of them. What I'll say is we've had a lot of very rich conversations in long range planning, talking about um, you know enrollment, certainly about the evolving uh, primary school project, looking at the the um, condition of our facilities and, and we've had some great conversations but what we really wanted to do was actually think about what was something we could bring to the conversation and actually we, I reached out to Andrew who's the chair of the building steering committee to say you know what can long range planning do, facilities planning do to enrich this conversation and really talk about this uh, from a district wide perspective and so in January we had a meeting where this idea kind of came out of our conversation of getting our heads around exactly how many classrooms we had at our different schools how many of those classrooms were brick and mortar or permanent structure versus in a portable uh, and then also looking at how many of those classrooms are used as standard classrooms and, and this was for a couple reasons one we really want to think about contingency planning. It's been one of our topics as of late. You know, we, we all know that there's um, several building projects that are circling around uh, our community, and it would be irresponsible of a planning committee not to say, okay, so what do we do if we can't do anything? And what does that mean for us? And how does that impact our students in our district? So that was part of it. Um, the other part of it was really just saying, you know, uh, we need to get our heads around exactly how our curriculum has changed because we've talked about that a few times both in open meetings and in committee meetings to say you know the schools today aren't what they were 20 years ago and I've often used the analogy in saying that you know you have uh, primary schools it's not just a bunch of classrooms with little yellow raincoats on hooks and lunch boxes there's a lot more that happens in those buildings and I wanted to try and find a way as the chair of the committee to quantify that and actually start to talk about it through some district uh, descriptive analytics which is what I do for a living um, so I asked at the end of the meeting for our assistant superintendent uh, to go out to the building administrators and gather some information from them specific to the types of classrooms that they have and how they're used. Um, the principals were able to get that to her. She was able to then get it back to the committee. And then I put it into this table. So that gets us to where the, what this table is. Um, so I'm just going to walk through. I'm not going to do a reading of every line of this thing, but I'll just tell you exactly what it is. So in the blue, for each of our schools, except the high school, because the high school is a little bit more complicated <laughs> in how they use classrooms. We do have the data from them, but it's a little more tricky to put it into this type of table. We will get it formatted like this, but it's just going to take a little more time. Um, but right now, most of our conversations are about middle school through primary anyway, so I thought it was important to get this data up for everyone. 
Um, so in the blue, getting back to that, we have our brick and mortar classroom count for each of our schools. Uh, and I also totaled up K2 as a phase at the bottom. We have the number of those classrooms that are used as standard classrooms and then a percentage that is derived from those two values. Replicate that for any of the buildings that have portables, that's in the green. And then uh, some of the whole thing, same format in yellow, basically combines all the classrooms together so that in the far right of this table, we can see overall what percentage of our classrooms, portable and brick and mortar, are used as standard classrooms versus used in other ways. And so your question is going to be, what are those other ways? And so let's go to the next slide. So on this slide, I pulled in Sandy's brand new fresh enrollment numbers that he presented just moments ago. And that's in the, call, the third column there for the same schools, same order. And then I took a look at the number of standard classrooms that are used in each of those buildings to get a basic average students per classroom. Of course, there's variability in this. Um, but looking across it, I, I'll speak for myself, and I'm sure you'll all have questions about it. The first thing that jumped out to me was how high this number was. I actually thought it was lower. Um, I, I had heard anecdotally that, you know, um, our primary school classrooms are more like 17 or 18. I remember hearing that. So to see it up at 19 doesn't sound like a big jump, but that is a significant difference when you think about the scale of this. Um, the last two columns bring in that non-standard classroom use, um, and I did that really for space savings. I just didn't want to make a whole other slide. So um, here we have the number of non-standard classrooms uh, in each of the schools. And then the principals were kind enough to provide for us exactly how those classrooms are used. And so I actually listed those out there. So you can see some of the variety. There's a lot of um, special education needs in each of those boxes. Um, but there's also specialist classes that are happening. There's uh, institutional coaches, uh, instructional, I'm not institutional, instructional coaches, uh, instructional support spaces, speech and occupational therapy, and a whole host of other things. Um, all, a lot of which has evolved in the course of the last several years. I know Hillary has a chart that I always talk about, the chart that unfolds, that shows, yeah, you always have it with you, don't I you? Always, I always, everywhere. <laughs> that shows just how much, in a different way, all of our demands on public education has increased. And so um, before I open it up, this is the beginning of a conversation. I'll also say that the Long Range Planning Committee uh, facilities Planning Committee has actually not seen this data like this yet. Uh, it was tabled at our last meeting because of one of those robust conversations I was re referencing earlier. Um, but I wanted to get up in front of the whole board as a way to kind of just kind of premiere it. Um, the Long Range Planning uh, Facilities Planning Committee will be discussing this for the majority, if not all, of our agenda at our next meeting. Um, so of course, members of the public that are listening from home, because we know we don't have any here, you're welcome to attend those meetings, of course. Um, but I just wanted to get this out for everyone to talk about, to think about. Um, and I want to just end by saying thank you to all the principals who took time out of their busy days to pull this together. And for, to Diane for shepherding this information back and forth so that we could look at it tonight and in future meetings. So there it is. Any questions? Kristen? I don't know. I love this. I've already told Nick I think this is so wonderful to have not just for your long range planning, but for the building steering committee there. It's one thing that was interesting to see is, you know, art and music being shared space in two of the buildings where a third building has, it, you just, it highlights some of the differences that you see school to school. I think also if you sit and do some simple math, which I did this afternoon, you can see sort of what's gonna to happen to the middle school a few years down the road that we really need to look at. I just, I love this and thank you so much for putting it together. Agreed. This was a lot of data. Thank you for pulling it all together in a way that it made sense. I, I'll chime in too, because I'm a slow processor, so I'm gonna to need to spend yeah. quite a bit of time looking at this, <laughs> but thank you very much for putting this together, and I will, I will uh, be forwarding my questions along. <laughs> Can I ask one more question on of this? Course. And it sort of goes to the building steering committee a little bit to long range planning, but when is that, like, is that also another thing waiting for the firm to be hired to determine what grades are gonna go in this new building? Like, how will they <laughs> approach that? Or will I'm a little bit murky, I, I mean, I. Yes and no, I would say, because um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit murky as to whether that's going to be, I think that is a board decision, but I just don't know if it's board driven. 
or not? Like, do we look at it ourselves and say, this is what we want you to do? That is an option. I think the, I think the more probable option is that, um, because that is something that we are asking of our firms, um, is, to, is to be able to facilitate some solutions for our district. Um, they're gonna be doing so much research, like boots down in the schools, that I feel like um, that is something that they would be able to come back to us and say, like, here's kind of what we see and, and here's like, I don't know, I mean, they could even say, here's five solutions and for us to look at, that's my guess as yeah. to how that's gonna go down. I mean, like I said, there's always, if I'm only one person, if the board decides that that's a decision they're making and I'm sure any firm will just, you know, go with what we've asked them to do, but I do think that that's a valuable resource when they're doing all that research anyway to, for them to come back to us and, and give us some options. It hasn't been forgotten about for sure because I, can, I mean, anyone can see that the middle school's in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, from a long-range planning perspective, the one thing I'll add is that um, the one of the meetings I came to for the Building Steering Committee, I can't remember which committee member it was, but someone was talking about when your firm comes in, they can design the school to do whatever you want it to do. And so I think one of the valuable things the firm, once selected, will be able to bring to us, will be able to show us, like, this is how we could design a school if you kept it K-2. This is how we could design it if it was K-3. And someone was even, I remember off the top of their head saying, you could set it up as two separate schools with two separate driveways with common space in the middle, and that way you'd only have two grades in each school. And this was just an idea he floated off the top of his head. But when I think about the value that these firms will bring in, I think once we can actually see what that would look like, it will help us as a board make a more informed decision. Because right now, I think it's tough to get away from, and I'm sure you've heard it, and I know I've heard it in the community, people having this kind of internal idea of like a civic center where you drop off little tiny children and hope they find their classroom. It's going to be very, very different than that, and it's one of the advantages, I think, of being able to design this school from scratch. And um, Hillary said it earlier, these firms, no matter which one we select, I'm sure will be ready to hit the ground running and be able to show us different solutions that will meet those core values that you typed up, Hillary, thank you, um, and give us a better idea of how shifting our phases around could look. And I just, I think that just from, um, just from looking at the RFQ responses and, and talking to people yesterday, I think that the amount of research and experience that they have making these schools seem, making these schools appropriate is amazing. Like even just looking at, and like I said, this is super high level information that they're giving us. This isn't even really drilling down into any of the details, but they think of every, I mean, they think of um, like the entrance to the school. If this is gonna be a big building, they want to actually design it so that, and this is just, a, I think a general architectural ideology, but they want to design it so that the bulk of the building is actually hidden. So that when the kids, these little kids are coming up to the front entrance of the building, they're seeing it as small and welcoming. And like those are things that we worry about but don't think about the solutions for. And I don't know if I ever would have thought of solutions. And um, other things like, like you don't have one super long hallway. You have hallways that are, um, that are like uh, jagged, not jagged, but like, um, uh, what is that word? Like they're not, they, they take like little angles and so that if you're- zigzag, I don't that's know. That's what I was gonna say. I'm just trying to explain it, but like so that when you're a five-year-old, you're not looking down this gigantic corridor and going, oh my God, what's at the end of that? You know, and they design like, I mean, they had everything from like, po you know, pods of classrooms that each had their own eating area to, you know, dividing up, um, to dividing up into, you know, three different capsules and then having common areas in the middle. I mean, the amount of, the amount of time, research, and energy that's gone into um, making these schools and designing them, like, properly for the, e either for the developmental age of the kids, well, definitely for the developmental age of the kids, but also, like, keeping in mind how big the school is overall. Um, and what ages are in it is pr is pretty amazing, and it's it's really cool to see. So I'm super excited to have that be more specific to us, like that information, because I've seen so much of it, and it's really exciting. And I mean, Sandy and Alicia have seen it too. Like it's really cool to look at, um, but it'll be interesting to see how it is 
is like really specific for okay. Scarborough. And it should be comforting to know that it's not a novel concern to oh, Scarborough. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, this is what they do. The, these yeah. are, that's the concern that everybody has when they're building these schools. So they've done it and they have solutions and um, they just need to work to what we need them to do. One example was actually like a, a main entrance that was really basically only for parents and visitors. And then like there were three different pods of schools and kids entered their school through the pod that they go to school in. And those doors were only open for drop off and pick, um, actually I think just, no, drop off and pick up. Um, they, so they, they felt, I mean, they're going into this little small school and those they're locked for the rest of the day for security, obviously. And then there's another, a separate main entrance that's where, you know, visitors and packages. And I, I, I they're like, some really cool ideas out there. Cool. That did, what was your question? I think I went way off topic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's just really exciting. It's like it is really yeah. cool stuff. Um, just as an observation, I love seeing you this animated about it. Like it's getting me more excited. <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, curriculum <laughs> committee. Yeah, we had our first curriculum committee meeting since I've been on the board. Um, it's a pretty new group. I think Nick is continuing on and that's it. Um, we talked about the 2020 building walks and Monique is going to work with the Leadership Council to get us some dates. You all know far more about those than I do, but they sounded to Best be a day huge of the year. success. <laughs> Super fun. So I don't, I don't want to, I'm going to interrupt. Yes, I don't want to interrupt and then I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> last year, I don't think the intent was to have the full board. I think the intent was to have the curriculum committee and then I kind of like snuck my way on to those because someone wasn't able to go. And so my request would be that the whole board is yes, it will be the whole board. able to go. Yeah. It will be the whole board. <laughs> yeah. Or offered. Right. Thank you. Is that the thing where you got to like crab walk? Yep. Yes. You got I to played play basketball. Work. I crab walked. You crab walked. <laughs> I did a PE class at Blue Point. Um, I don't know. I was like, it was super fun. Yeah. Some, people, some people, not my group, but some people at the high school did like a science experiment with marshmallows yeah. or something. Anyway. Hmm. Yeah, they sound fun. So, so yeah, those will be coming. It's a fun day. It's a fun opportunity for us to get into schools, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we talked about was the curriculum guide for families, which sounds like it's going to be super cool. It got put a little bit on the back burner just because Kathy has some mm -hmm. other pressing responsibilities, mm -hmm. but they're going to be back on that in the summer. <coughs> um, and then iReady was another thing that we talked about, the new assessment tool that we started this year. And it sounds like the feedback from the teachers has been great so far. They're using it. I think Monique said what it was like almost all of the teachers have accessed these additional tools that they have, which have been free so far, but they will not be free next year. So you guys, as a finance committee, should be expecting to see that. Great. All right, ladies on rules. Um, the Community Center Committee, quick update. Town Council, the presentation um, from the ad hoc committee is taking place this Wednesday night, I believe it's six o'clock. Um, but I had sent to everybody the very done report um, for folks at home. Um, that consultant report is on the town website along with the very large presentation that the ad hoc committee put together um, regarding the community center. So it'll be interesting to see how that presentation uh, it goes Wednesday night. Town Council? Um, a lot of what I was <clears throat> I would give for a town council update has been covered by other committees. Um, so I don't I don't think I have much to add to there. Um, vocational hasn't met since the last time we did committee updates. My next meeting is Thursday the nineteenth. Um, but since then, um, and I forward this to the board, um, it came from Diane also was that survey. Um, oh, yeah. And mostly I wanted everyone on the board um, to weigh in to play around with the software. Um, that was um, a piece <coughs> of software that we had looked at several years ago. Um, it's called Thought Exchange. Um, it comes with a very hefty price tag. Um, and so uh, Gorham has a license for it. And so we were able to, they generously put together the thought experiment for the Vogue program um, so that we could use that software. Um, and so I will report out on what exactly that looks like. I'm excited to see how they present that, the results of that survey. Okay. It looked like a pretty cool tool. Yeah. Mm. 
on the <coughs> task force, so Diane and I met to sort of talk about reconvening the task force that existed quite some time ago. Um, so we're sort of just at a point of pulling, Diane's pulled a lot of information about surrounding towns, about what that, how many students we might serve here. It's really so open-ended, and this is another thing where it's difficult. It can't just be my opinion. So at some point, I think we as a board have to talk about why we're looking at this now. You know, um, the CDS, the bill about moving CDS to the local schools was recommended ought not to pass. So that's sort of off the table. And then the pre-K thing was pushed out to 25, 23, 24, 24. So there's not a huge sense of urgency, but we should still look at it. And again, Diane and I have looked at some stuff. We need to probably meet again and plan next steps. Can I just ask, and yeah. I don't know if you know this, but um, so if, it, if that was pushed out to 23, 24, does that mean that they're not even gonna talk about it again until 23, 24, or that would be that's, the target for having pre-K? That's the target but for not. having it. Right, so the original date was 2017, 2018. Right. And so they just pushed it well forward. And so, you know, the wonder would be, is that going to happen again before right. 23, 24? 23, 24, okay. So that's really only three years. Because Governor Mills hasn't had much success in getting more Trash. funding okay. for that. Um, she had put in for yeah. $7 million right. dollars last denied, year yeah. in that, um, did not pass. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then CNA? I'm gonna, <coughs> I'm gonna pass uh, CNA to Kristen. She was able to go and I was not. I'm gonna read the charge from Sandy's email to the entire <coughs> Comprehensive Needs Assessment Committee just because it's a good refresher for me, but it's to review various data and evidence pertaining to student performance and district effectiveness and then identify strengths and areas for improvement. So this was the first meeting we've had this year. We had three last year, I think. So this was the first one we had this year and just covered some of the district goals. One of the big ones being social emotional learning, which everyone's going to start hearing a lot about, but broke into our groups and talked by the different phase levels. Uh, it's, the attendance was a little bit down, I would say. So it would be nice to sort of pick that back up. But it's a good chance for everyone to talk. There's some community members there. I went in. Was there anything pressing coming out of that? No, right on. Good. Okay. Great. Oh, lots happening for sure. All right. Um, our one item of new business. Can I have a motion, please, to accept the meeting minutes of the workshop for February 27th, 2020, as written? So moved. Second. Any discussion? And all those in favor? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Um, before we close, April, thank you last week for covering. Um, really appreciate that. I'm sure everyone, after getting hearing what had happened, understood why I wasn't here. We're probably grateful that I wasn't, um, so that I didn't share anything. Um, that said, 11.0 was a motion to adjourn. Is there such a motion? So moved. Second. And all those in favor? Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.